Friday nights. You know what that means. It's Team Talks nights. Welcome to the show, everybody. And what a bumper show we have in store. Match Week 33 is here, and we are getting you hyped for another cracking week in the Premier League. Let's take a look at the fixtures. Starting off at Newcastle, where they host Tottenham in the lunchtime kickoff here in the UK. Brentford, Sheffield United, Burnley, Brighton, Man City, Luton, and Nottingham Forest versus Wolves all kicking off at the same time. And then the late game, Bournemouth versus Manchester United. Three on Sunday, including two of the title contenders in action, Liverpool, Crystal Palace, and Arsenal, Aston Villa to end off Sunday's action. There's one game on Monday, and that sees Chelsea at home against Everton. State of play in the Premier League, and there is no room to breathe anywhere on this table. 71 Arsenal, 71 Liverpool, 70 Man City. One of the most exciting title races that we have seen in a long time. Tottenham are in fourth and they are level on points with fifth place Aston Villa. Little gap on Manchester United then. Let's look at the bottom of the table. Everton having uh, been deducted now eight points in total. They are in 16th, just two points clear of Nottingham Forest, who themselves are above the drop zone only on goal difference. Luton on 25 points. Burnley and Sheffield United also in danger there. We are in the run-in. It is getting heated every week. Just when we think it cannot possibly go up another notch, we introduce Rachel Corsi to Team Talks. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, wow, the pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, and you also have further reason for celebration because this week you racked up 150 caps for Scotland. That is incredible. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, yeah. I'm glad we actually won because I, I did say on Tuesday night, I said I wouldn't have been able to celebrate had we not. So um, we got ourselves over the line. And you've celebrated and now you are here and ready to talk about, to uh, yeah, Match Week 33. Looking forward to it. Darren Lewis says uh, 150 caps on Team Talks. Um, <laughs> I think and... you can say I was 150 years old. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. You work. You got the colour combo. Exactly, I've got the memo. Yeah, so we are onside tonight, so don't worry about it. Semi-automated offsides mm. has been all the talk this week. Your take on it? A great thing shows that the Premier League is moving forward as ever. Everyone around the world watching it will be delighted that we won't now have that subjectivity which has at times fallen down. Uh, everybody remembers the Spurs less, uh, Liverpool game earlier this season mm -hmm. and the fallout from that, the drama from that will take that all away, leave it in the hands of technology, move the game on. Absolutely. That and so much more to talk about tonight on this episode of Team Talks. Mikel Arteta's Arsenal continue their title charge. Next up, former Gunners boss Sunai Emery and his top four chasing Villa. Man City have a 24-hour advantage over their title rivals this week. They are in action on Saturday against the Luton side fighting to stay in the Premier League. And Newcastle's excellent home form faces a huge test with free-scoring Spurs looking to cement top four. Getting into Champions League also means greater demands. Demands on players, demands on the squad. Um, and you have to be geared up for it or else it can, it can affect all parts of, of your season. We begin with Arsenal, Aston Villa. Let's hear from both managers, starting with Mikel Arteta. He's done it in so many different countries, in so many different contexts, and he's been incredibly successful. Um, obviously, he's very close to my hometown. I have huge admiration for him and huge respect and um, wishing the best after Sunday. And But what he's doing again, I think it's, uh, it's really impressive. We are playing in Emirates, we are playing as well uh, in the different context. Now they are playing, fighting for the trophy of uh, the Premier League to, 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 to win the, the Premier League this year. And we are now fighting behind them, trying to, to keep our fifth position we have now and, and fighting with Tottenham and, and different because as well, uh, some players, of course, uh, being injured, they are not going to, to play on Sunday. Rachel, so fascinated to hear some of your takes on what's been happening on the Premier League, uh, in the Premier League this season. And Arsenal, Aston Villa is the first game we're talking about. Let's get your thoughts on Arsenal because they are top of the table. Mm. But it feels like... They're still maybe not the favourites. Everyone's looking at Man City and Liverpool as well. And the Gunners seem to have a little bit of a different spice and flavour than last season. What do you think? Yeah, they do. I, I think when I've spoken about this before, I think last season everyone couldn't quite believe yeah. how well they were going at the start. And I think in some ways that tripped them up a little bit. I think eventually that did get to them. I feel this, this year they probably, 
you know, people didn't quite expect, know what to expect. They weren't sure they were going to be able to have the same form. They didn't sit in that top spot for as long. Um, and now they've sort of come there at this point in the season. And I, I actually think that's probably helped them a lot. Mm. Um, I think the fact maybe some people still doubt them probably still helps them. Um, I still think there's going to be twists and turns. I've really enjoyed watching them this season from a, a, just a pure footballing perspective. I think. And probably from a defensive perspective as well. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think you probably have to look back a long time to mm. probably see an Arsenal side that, you know, pride themselves on that 1-0 to the Arsenal chance. Well, last week, there was that shot in the 91st minute of Gabriel celebrating yeah. a block. He blocked a yeah. shot, he gets up. Is that, what, is that a defender's... You, you can talk talk us through that. What, why, what, what is that all about? That, to me, has to be something that they've spoken about. And I think we've seen it throughout the season. That, you know, I think other teams now do it as well. I think other teams have seen teams do it and think, yeah, yeah. We, we should celebrate this. Yeah. This is a good thing. But that has to be something you speak about because that isn't something that I would say naturally happens. Yeah. You know, there can be moments you do a little, mm. something good in training, but it feels very intentional. Yeah. And I think there's something very powerful in, you know, celebrating all the good moments at, at different points in the game at... Pretty typically, the, the team that concedes the less goals mm. is up there, you know, at the end of the season. And yeah. I think they've they've been fantastic this year in terms of their discipline, their organisation. They've put a lot of attention on the small details. Mm. Their set pieces, you know, fodder, something people speak about, but set pieces against are, you know, a huge thing. Defending the penalty area, um, they give very, very few chances away. And it's undoubtedly probably the actually the thing that has been the most significant, I would say, this season compared to others that's puts them, in my opinion, as the favourites for me. I, I think they probably are the team for me that I just have a feeling they might go on and win it. Have you seen my notes? No. Did you Did you have a look at my notes? Because my question was about the Gabrielle and the celebration. It shocked me <laughs> that they celebrated that as much as they did the goals. Do you know why? The numbers. Mm. And you know I love the numbers, uh, so forgive me, indulge me for a second. The stats, later. man. But the numbers around Arsenal back up entirely what you've been saying. Uh, haven't conceded a goal in five uh, mm. away games. Um, they're one of ten of their last 11. They've scored 38 goals. They've conceded four. That is just ridiculous. And I think Arsenal at the moment, they are like... <laughs> a lot of people are still sleeping on Arsenal. Because mm. they kind of look at City, they've done it five of the last six seasons. They look at Liverpool, uh, the only team to break their sequence. And then they look at Arsenal, they haven't done it for 20 odd years. But Arsenal, for me, they're like the team that turns up for a job interview with the qualifications. And then you've got City with the work experience. Yeah. They've done it, they've been yeah. there, they know the job. And then you've got Liverpool, who they've been to university. <laughs> so they've got the degree, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but everything about Arsenal right now, there's the remaining fixtures on the screen. The, 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 I, I look at all of them teams, all of those teams, journalist, and, uh, and I think to myself, they can beat them. Why? Because they've got the best mm -hmm. defence. They've scored the most goals. They scored the most goals from crosses. They scored the most goals from set pieces. They are so meticulous about everything that they do. They've got a good culture in the team. And Villa's record against Arsenal, it's not good. So I, I just think everything that you're saying at the moment, Arsenal fans must wonder, what do we have to do for people to say that we're favourites? You talk about Villa uh, and their record against Arsenal. They did win 1-0 in December. But a Villa clean sheet at the moment is seeming like uh, very difficult, especially if we consider what happened against Brentford at the weekend. They can't defend like that at the Emirates. No, they can, and I think that was a, a little, for me anyway, I felt that was uncharacteristic. Um, you know, just, they obviously had that little, I think the second half was probably very different to how the first half played out, but just had that period where, you know, conceding goals consecutively, I, I don't think we've we've seen that. I think defensively they, they have been good this season. I think it, it's been an adjustment. They've had to play different players. They've obviously had the injuries that people have spoken about, and there have been... You know, I think everyone's had to play their part um, when you look at the back fours that have started different games. But, yeah, you, you can't play Arsenal and, and allow them to have that many opportunities. And especially if you get the lead, you have to be a lot more secure in, in you know, trying to just be, do all the little things intelligently that, that get those minutes to tick along, you know, when you do go ahead. So I think it'll be a tough one. I actually think the biggest thing might be the crowd. I think a lot of people have... Well, when you think back to Emery at Arsenal, I think... 
he was dismissed pretty quickly. I think people mm. decided he wasn't the right person for that job. And, um, you know, he's very clearly an excellent manager. He, the things he's done at Villa has been fantastic. Yeah. It's been amazing to see sort of firsthand almost. Mm. Um, I think the biggest thing will be sort of how the crowd anticipates that. And I think if you have 60,000 people feeling nervous, I think that might be Arteta's biggest... I don't know what you'd call it, but something he maybe has to try and manage with his players. You know, it's difficult to affect the crowd, but the crowd can be such a huge influence. Yeah. And I think that will be one of the biggest things in these last few games. You often see Martin Odegaard kind of hyping. Rally the crowd. Yeah, have you seen yeah. that? Yeah. And I think probably, you know, this weekend, it's every weekend from now on in, but you can feel that as a player. You can feel the energy from outside, you know, and you sort of say, you do the thing, you're like, you need to shut that out, you need to shut the noise out. You hear bits, you yeah. feel bits. That it would be impossible not to. And you know, you do all your prep work through the week. You have habits that you've got to try and you know control what you can control and all these things. But in sport, we know you know when you get those nerves, yeah. it can affect the players on the pitch. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think if you look at Villa's recent form, they've won one of the last five Premier League games. And the closer they get to a Champions League place, which they had no right to even be talking about at the start of the season. And that speaks to the job that Emery's done. Mm. The, the more of a wobble they're having, they only won three of their last eight in all competitions. And they've been ripped apart with injuries at the back, in particular where they've had a number of players with ACLs, as, as, as we know. And I, I think it is going to be about managing those early moments. And I just wonder if, if Villa start fast and get into Arsenal and mm -hmm. make them start to think about it and maybe get a little bit of anxiety in the crowd, as you've been saying, that might be their best chance of being able to pull something off. What's interesting for me as well is obviously the European football um, factor. And, you know, we've been saying all along or looking out and th this word coefficient has come into play and maybe there's going to be five teams. But now Tottenham have overtaken Villa mm -hmm. on goal difference. And Villa actually need to get into their top four because they were the only one of the uh, Premier League teams this week in European action that managed to get a victory. So it's looking like top four is the one again. And so the stakes have just gone up a little bit, e even though, ironically, they are the only ones who won this week. Yeah, and actually just on the game this week, I think it might actually be really good prep for the game this weekend. Um, I thought Lille were really impressive and probably didn't quite anticipate they would have so much of the ball, but I think in many ways, you know, that probably aligns you perfectly to then going to this game. They were, I thought Villa were very efficient in the sense that they made use of set plays very well. Um, there was, they needed Martinez a few times, he made some big saves in the first half, but, you know, I, I think that's the nature of how they play. I, I just felt it, it actually was a good game to have. I think it was good preparation. They got a good result. And you're absolutely right. I think probably... I think Villa will feel we want to finish in the top four. Mm. Um, I think for both Villa and Spurs, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of points to be gained and I think there's a lot of tough games ahead. So I think that that battle is going to go right to the wire as well. All of it is, hey? So few <laughs> weeks left in the Premier League and we're setting up for a grandstand finish, I think. We're moving on to Manchester City's clash with Luton and we're going to hear from Pep Guardiola and Rob Edwards. <laughs> Premier League is so important and I expect a game more similar that uh, would happen in the Premier League when we won 2-1 at the end than the FA Cup uh, and we have to be ready. So it's 11 months, 10 months fighting for the title. Yeah. We know the position that we are, that we cannot drop points. We believe we've got a good plan. We know going into any game against Manchester City at their place, you've got to be able to defend well. Um, yeah, we're going to need everyone to, to be a, a 9, 9.5, 10 out of 10 um, to get something from the game. And we're probably going to have to ride a bit of luck. Thomas will probably have to make some saves um, if we're going to get something from the game. We need everybody to be at a 9.5 or a 10. <laughs> it's a small ask, that. Third from top against third from bottom. Some mm. symmetry there. And also probably a level of desperation from both, knowing what's at stake. Yeah, that's fair to say. I, I think City have got the firepower up front to be able to cause problems, obviously. Yeah. Haaland, the leading scorer in the Premier League. De Bruyne missed the game in midweek, but he should be back at the weekend. Foden's got a great record, goal-scoring record at the moment. Um, I think he's one goal away from 15 all competitions for Manchester City. Um, and he's at the top of his game. But he did limp out the game the other day, so maybe they might rest him uh, for the second leg against Real Madrid. It's hard with 
uh, Luton because they just don't give up. Mm. And even though on paper this is cities to win comfortably, that's what we said at the uh, head of the game at Kenilworth Road. And in the end, City were in a fight to get the mm. points. And there's just, I'm going to call it now, I shouldn't do this, but this is my team talks moment of doom. <laughs> I think Luton will stay up. I do. I'm not doing a prediction for the game tomorrow. Producers in my ear, but I will say. I was caught out of it by that as well. I was like, whoa, what? How? But I do think Luton will stay up. I, I will say it. I just think they've got such a, a fantastic will in that side. They've got the quality and they've got the desire and the hunger. And sometimes that hard work beats the talent when the talent doesn't work hard. And I think as far as they're concerned, Rob Edwards, for me, he'd be in line up for manager of the season if they mm. stay up. And I think they've got a chance. I don't. Look, cards on the table, City should have the quality to edge this one. But I do think Luton will stay up. But you know, with Luton, unlike some of the other teams around them, as you said, they just don't give up. They have not been run over the season. Uh, OK, they lost 6-2 to City in the FA Cup, but they did lose 2-1 to City when they played at the Kenny. They are plucky, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And there's, you know, I agree with Darren, there's something about them that you, you want to almost root for them um, yeah. he's, they do just keep going they've scored so many late goals um, Carter Morris is I think that's the other thing you know players like that who've, who've been a part of the club yes. have got them to, yeah. to the success of being in the Premier League you want those players to then also get the chance to enjoy the Premier League so then to see them having this fighting chance I think just it keeps you invested 100% I, I mean I love this I absolutely love this because I love in a game that's awash with money and for so many players, the game means so little. To see it means so much mm -hmm. to a player who's been with the club through the leagues and scores a key goal, a crucial goal, mm -hmm. at a point where everyone thought it was beyond them. It, it was fabulous and I think they've won a lot of friends um, because they embody what this game is all about at Luton. And... Like I said, I think City will have too much quality on this occasion. They haven't lost at the Etihad since November 2022. But Luton, set pieces might be a help for them. Only Everton and Arsenal scored more goals from set pieces so far this season. I'm doing the hand thing again. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Man City have only conceded two goals from set pieces. Uh, I've just been reminded. Um, so they don't really concede many from set pieces. So hmm. that's an interesting battle there. Luton yeah. have also not kept a clean sheet on the road yet. You're going to start so... battle with me today. Sorry? You're going to start battle with me today. No, I just thought I might ha uh, help you get into a groove <laughs> since you were caught on the hand because you can't breathe. Look at you. It's completely, it's, it's hit you for a six there. It's up and up. He can't find his words. Use your words. He's gone. <laughs> uh, I'm intimidated. <laughs> I don't believe it. He's, I've never seen him giggle like this before. Oh, no. Brilliant. OK, let's, let's talk about it yes. from a city perspective. Mm. They have this 24-hour advantage. We've every week sat on this couch and tried to work out, is it better to play first or second? Or is it better to play the next day or... City are playing on Saturday, Liverpool and Arsenal on Sunday. That is a huge advantage for them. I, I as from my perspective as a player, yeah, I think you want the points on the board. Um, so I think if you can play first and get the job done, then I, th I think that's that's putting a little more pressure on the ones mm -hmm. behind, no doubt. Um, I think the fact it's separate days, in some ways, I think lessens kind of the impact it has you know I think when you see teams kick off if you're like the early kick off on a Saturday and then you're the, the late yeah. kick off I think that definitely can impact you a bit more because typically you know you're, you're seeing the game you, you will see the result it's, it's very difficult to not um so yeah I think at this point you have to take everything that's an that could possibly be one percent get it in your corner so yeah that's absolutely I think those teams that are playing early will be like let's make sure we yeah. put ourselves back on top and put the pressure on the rest yeah, they do face a fight, though. Everything we've said about Luton um, mm. indicates the fact that it's going to be a big battle, as everything is at the stage yeah. of the season now. But for Manchester City, you mentioned, mentioned Phil Foden, and it feels like he's been leading the charge in, in many ways for them. Yeah, you know, a lot of people give um, Erling Haaland stick about the fact that he hasn't... He, I think he scored one goal in his last five. But City are still in there because of this. This guy is pure gold. Mm. He... 
picks up fantastic positions. He ghosts into space between defenders. And his composure in the final third is first class. Dead ball situations, outstanding. He is able to slalom past defenders, draw players out of position. And when he gets his opportunities, he takes them. And this is very much the reason why City are still a team. You might say that Haaland is quiet, but behind him there is a stellar sporting cast led by this guy. Yeah, he's one of he's certainly been one of the best in the Premier League this season, you mm. can't argue that. Mm. 14 goals um, is his best in a season, 14 in the Premier League, and uh, playing some of his best football, nine goals in nine Premier League games. We haven't even talked about the others, except for Haaland, who by his standards is not to his usual best. But the supporting cast you mentioned, that's always been City's biggest advantage. It has, and even though defensively they've not been as stable as they have been in recent seasons, the reason why they're still in the hunt and they could still become the first team to win four Premier League titles in a row is because of that front six, is because mm -hmm. of the people prepared to take responsibility. De Bruyne did it the other day when they were kind of faffing around and then he just grabbed the ball left side of the penalty box, wraps his right foot around it and puts one into the top corner. Foden is prepared. We've just seen yeah. a showcase of his goals. Bernardo Silva could come up one with one at any time. Interestingly, uh, Rodri might not play, doing the hand, Rodri might not play uh, tomorrow for the first time in, what, 66 games because he just looks as though he's a little bit off the boil at the moment. But... The other players who are there in this moment at the Etihad, I do not expect them to lose this game. I expect them to continue the pressure on the other two teams. What's the stat about Rodri when he plays, they don't lose? Would they you be lose. thinking about that as a player? Like, oh, if he doesn't play, what does that mean? Uh, you know, <laughs> superstition? I don't think so. I think in some ways it's a credit to Pep that, you know, he's going to say it, I think, you know, what I'm seeing is someone who's looking a little tired and a, a little bit off. Yeah. Still ridiculously good. You're talking about someone who makes very, very, very few mistakes. But I think, you know, I think he has spoken through the week. There's, there's been some report. You know, he's played so many games, fifth, I think, around the world since oh, across the last five yeah. years. Or, you know, the stats case, so I'm, I'm not going to even try and get close <laughs> to what it actually was. But I, I, do, I did see it this week, and it, he is right up there. And it's not just about this season. It's like an accumulation over four or five seasons. So, yeah, you, you got to look after players and you don't want to be in a position where you end up having to take him out because he's got hurt. So it's probably a smart thing. Um, but yeah, there's so much talent, so much. It's unbelievable. Well, when Newcastle and Spurs met at St James's Park last time, the Magpies whipped the North London side 6-1. More on their meeting this weekend when we come back. Welcome to another one of those frenzied tight side afternoons. It's hard to argue with those who build this match as the most important of the league campaign so far for each of these teams. Almost a perfect start, it is. It's taken Newcastle a minute. Jacob Murphy to Linton. He's in again. Six minutes of magpie magnificence. Shocking defending from the visitors. Oh, it's free. It's an absolute stunner from Murphy. Tottenham again have embarrassed themselves. It simply goes from bad to worse for Tottenham Hotspur. Oh, they've done it again! An instant double strike! Well, Newcastle have got their foot on the throttle. Tottenham, they've lost their bottle. Little poke towards goal, and it's in for six. Tottenham are now in the territory of disgrace. Stuff that Geordie dreams are made of. Well, it's Newcastle versus Tottenham again this weekend, and we're going to hear from the managers ahead of that one. Eddie Howe, followed by Ange Postacoglu. It's a memorable game and a memorable uh, opening part of the match. I think this is a totally different Tottenham team now. I think, um, you know, they've played very well this year. Watched them a lot. I admire them tactically. I admire them physically. Um, I think they've done very well, and I think Ange deserves big uh, credit for how his philosophy has been implemented in the speed that it has and just generally how they've played. When I watch them, and particularly at home, they're still a very, very good side. I think the crowd gives them a lot of energy, irrespective of who they put out there. And the games, irrespective of who they play against, tend to be <clears throat> fairly high tempo because of the energy in the stadium. So we're going to have to match that energy tomorrow. I mean, it's the way we like to play our football as well. So 
hopefully, um, you know, by by bringing our own energy to it, we can, you know, we can sort of overcome the challenge. Uh, it's going to be a tough one. Darren, let me tee you up to hit us with the stats. <laughs> I am expecting goals in this game. Am I right? You would be right to expect goals. Am I right to game. expect goals? Why? Well, because Spurs have only failed to score in one of their last 43 Premier League games. It's an incredible record. Everyone thought they'd fall apart when uh, Harry Kane left at the start of the season. Mm -hmm. But players are taking responsibility. They play the front foot football that Postacoglu has always aspired to when he was a young boy as a player and when he became a manager. Um, set against that. Newcastle, they go for it. And mm. uh, spearheaded by Isaac, we saw him in the VT just there. Uh, I think he's now five goals in a ray, row that he has scored for them. Is that right? Have I got that right or wrong? He You've scored the in the last five Premier League home games, scored that's six right. in total. Yeah, of course and... that's right. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, just checking. Um, but, you know, I, I expect this to be a barnstorm because Newcastle's record against Spurs is not good. They've lost six of the last nine home games against Spurs and they've got to get a European place at the end of this season. Spurs have to retain that Champions League place that nobody thought they could get at the start of the season. And so I, I think there are going to be a lot of goals in this game. And I, I think the big winner is, is going to be us. Absolutely. Newcastle went through that patch um, where they lost six in seven games. Very different now, though. They seem to have found their way again, only lost two of the last ten. Yeah, I think in some ways the fact that you know, they, they had a bad run, people stopped talking about them. I think that allowed them to just almost just level off. Yeah. I, I think people were, were very critical. I, th I thought it was mm. too harsh. Um, you know, they, they did have injuries that they spoke about. It was a lot of their key players and there was a lot of... I think that made the environment quite emotional. A lot of the players are young players and you can find that, can sort of spark that extra emotion that just makes it a little difficult to be as consistent. Um, I think last weekend, again, we, we sort of saw the emotion of Eddie Howe. He's, you know, he, he demands a lot from his, his players, and I think the fans probably enjoyed that. They, they like to see that passion, and, um, yeah, they've found much more consistency and better form recently, and their season's absolutely not done either. I think if they can finish strongly, they can get themselves into a position in the table that I think you would still have to look look at and say they've still had a good season. You know, I think Champions League this year added a lot. I think some people disregard that. It adds a lot to your weeks, a lot of extra pressure, a lot of extra emotion, a lot of extra <laughs> running in the legs, you know, physically for the players. So I think they probably were a little harshly spoken about at the start and that little run they had that they didn't have quite as good form, I felt probably brought too much criticism. I, I thought it was a little unfair and you know, they've probably been a little quieter in terms of the headlines of the last few weeks, yeah. but let's just let them find that stability again. And they're a good side. They've got great players. And even though they're still missing a few, they've still got a team that when you see the 11 that will play this weekend, it will it will be a team that very much can compete with a Spurs team. Because what you have here, as you've set up, both of you, is a Spurs looking to cement that fourth place, knowing uh, that they'll play the following day and they are away at Arsenal. So that's daunting for them. Spurs have that advantage of playing 24 hours earlier. Then you've got a Newcastle side that are really only two points behind Manchester United. And if they get the victory, they would go up into sixth place, at least temporarily, put themselves in that conversation in the fight. They're right in there. They yeah, are right in there. And they looked as... Uh... Rachel was saying they looked as though they were falling away, but maybe it helped them not having that pressure on them because they'd lost so many players to injury that the expectation suddenly fell away, whereas it had been there and there had been that anxiety amongst the fans as well. But everybody is now understanding that Eddie Howe's had a crippling injuries to deal with, set against that. Ange Postacoglu's had a number of players back, and now they are very, very strong Spurs. I think that the... the, the for Spurs, what they've got to do, at, at, and postacoglu has been exceptional at it, is taking the pressure off his players and saying, look, we're not aiming for fourth place. And that's been quite interesting because us as journalists, when we go to press conferences, we have grown up in the last, what, 15 years or whatever, with the belief that you've got to get into the Champions League. Mm. But what he has said is, I need to build a squad because if I don't build a squad packed with quality, then I'll end up in a situation Newcastle find themselves in where they start the season with lots of aspirations. They lose key players in that first 11, 12, 13, and then they fall to pieces. I cannot have that happen to this Spurs team. So I've got to build, I've got to get the right players in so that we are not Newcastle 
if we do finish in the top four next season. Right, the busy Saturday in the Premier League ends when um, Bournemouth take on Manchester United. Sorry, it just took me a second there. <laughs> oh, we're going to hear from the managers now, starting with Andoni Iraola and then Eric Ten Hag. United doesn't forgive you. Sometimes you think you are playing well against them or you are in control of the game and you lose your focus three minutes and then you are down. You are down and they score a couple of goals in two, three minutes. We've seen it last games where probably they were not playing well and then boom, boom. They have a great transition team, very good attacking players. So uh, I think we have to be... Uh, very good in both boxes against the uh, top opposition at the end what you do in the in the boxes is what makes the difference they, they battled us and we lost the battles so and tomorrow will not different uh, that is the way uh, they play so they want to fight with you and so it's about uh, make sure uh, you go in that fight and you have the convincement and you have uh, so the belief and you need to support each other uh, to win the battles and uh, to uh, to over, uh, to outplay them and uh, to outrun them and in defending to match the runs manchester united what a week it was for them last time out rachel because they had that collapse at chelsea um and then they needed a big performance and i think drawing with liverpool is as big as it gets at this moment in time uh, because of where Liverpool are and the way that they're playing. What do you think about Manchester United and their European dreams? They obviously can't say that they've given up on Champions League yet, but is it just too far for them? I think the biggest thing with Manchester United is you, you start to feel like you, we're, we're starting to see something. Yeah. You get that optimism and then something else happens and you think, mm, are we? And, and I think we've sat here and discussed this too. And I, Many times. You know, I, I watched that Chelsea game and it was one of the strangest games. It was, it was as if like the midfield weren't allowed to participate. And each team just took, yeah. took turns <laughs> yeah. of going 4v3 against the back line. It was so bizarre. It was great to watch, but it was so bizarre. <laughs> and then, you know, you're going from that then into the Liverpool game. Before that game, I thought, there, you know, I just couldn't see a way that they could get anything out of it. And part of you is going, yeah, but it's the rivalry, the history, surely... And somehow they did get something out of it, although I think a lot of people probably are still thinking, I can't believe Liverpool weren't out of sight in the first half. Um, I, I definitely think Europe, is, you know, finishing, catching Villa or Spurs, I think is probably going to be really, really difficult. I just can't see either of those two teams dropping enough points and Man United consistently getting putting a, a run of results together that will get them there. Um, and that's not because I don't think they're capable of it. I just don't think I've seen it from... You know the, the system they're playing and what they're being asked to do. I, it's just so difficult to to know what you're going to get. And some of their senior players as well. We know their defensive problems have been spoken about so often. The number of different defensive pairings. But I want to talk about shouldering the responsibility up front. And when you've got a teenager in Komimainu coming up with uh, class goals, of mm. course that speaks about his talent. But it also makes <coughs> you wonder, like if they're depending on him to do it, what does that mean? Uh, they are, uh, but he's capable of shouldering that responsibility. Everything that's positive about Man United now, for me, comes from their young players. Hoyland, Garnacho, yeah. Maynou. Um, they had their the young defender who started last week. But uh, Maynou is a player, we talk about taking responsibility. He is somebody who's prepared to do that. The quality of this finish there, the composure inside the box surrounded by players, tells you everything about the player he is but more importantly, the player he's going to be. And they remind me a lot, Manchester United, of Arsenal in the last days of the old guard mm. when it was the younger players who showed the promise that Mikel Arteta decided to invest in because Kambi Menu is a poster boy. Look at this finish here. It's a wonderful turn. Uh, how do you defend against that? Uh, and at the moment, and the great you can speak better than this to me, better to this than me, Defenders haven't yet worked out how to work him out, mm. if that makes sense. I, I think he is yep. surprising defenders with the positions he's taken up and the quality of his finishes. Yeah, and I think just because he is young, there's a lot more freedom and sort of just willingness to try things. You know, he probably hasn't got into that rhythm where he, he does sort of the same sort of patterned habits that you, you typically find players do as they get older. Um, just unpredictability, I think, brings 
you know, some great things from him, on top of the fact he's enormously talented. Um, and I totally agree. I think the real positive that's come out of United this season and certainly the last few games has been the fact that those young players have been, without doubt, the biggest promise we've seen in the last few seasons from the club. Um, the, the difficulty with that is, and possibly that's why they are a little bit unpredictable in what you're going to get, is that you, know, you can't expect young players to be consistently at that very, very top level. Yeah. We've seen what they're capable of, and it's absolutely no doubt they can play at the top level, do great things. But to rely on them consistently, I think that's that's been the, the toughest thing for United. The, the senior players have, by no way, made the same contribution, and mm. you know I'm sure that's something in the summer um, will be a big part of the process to keep them moving in the right direction. Just very quickly, Darren, what are we going to see from Bournemouth? We know they lost last time out. But they've won three in a row at home. They've never gone four. They beat United 3-0 at Old Trafford in December. They've never gone back-to-back. -back. They've never done the double over United in the Premier League. Is this the right time for them to do it? What yes. do we see? In a word, yes. No sitting on the fence with this one. Rachel's right. You don't know which United are going to turn up. And I think as far as Bournemouth are concerned, they will look at the fact that United have conceded 554 shots on goal so far this season. Only Sheffield United have conceded more. And I think... Uh, uh, their, their striker, Dominic Solanke. Yeah. Uh, I think he's one short of the, the the goal total from Joshua King, which was 18. Um, and I think he will spearhead the attack and he will be saying to his players, and I think Andoni was saying uh, to his players as well, go at them. Mm. Don't be afraid. They're not the, the force they were. They're Man United in, main, in name. Go at them. Attack them. See what they're made of and see whether you can get some joy. And I think they will. Now, last week was an emotional roller coaster for Chelsea fans with the win over Man United, then the draw with the Blades. What will we see against Everton? More on that game when we come back. Greatness comes from everywhere, no room for racism. Anywhere. We're turning attention now to Chelsea's battle with Everton. Here's Mauricio Pochettino and Sean Dyche. When we face teams like uh, Manchester City or Manchester United or Tottenham or Liverpool, I seen always the team show good quality. The problem is to be consistent when, for us, when we analyze the, the team, is lack of maturity, you know. And that is only with time that we can get the, the right balance. Maurizio is someone I've, I've always had respect for. I uh, always liked the work that he puts in. Obviously a, a topsy-turvy style season by their standards. A lot of changes there, a lot of changes in culture, I'm sure, from the way he works. Um, you know, we do it as beaten well at this place in the sense we delivered a good performance, uh, but that doesn't guarantee the next one. You know, I always make that clear to the players. They're a good outfit. They spent a lot of money over the last few years, which everyone knows, and they have some quality uh, without doubt. So we've got to make sure that we deliver, and that's the standard process of what I go through with the players. Um, don't rely on anyone else other than ourselves. What a week for the Toffees. They got their first Premier League win in 13 We're trying games. to decide if he's dyed his hair. I can't decide. I'm going, light. I'm going with it was the light. I'm going it was the light. I'm going okay. with the light. Can we, get, can we get back to the football? If, if we... <laughs> Unless he's, okay? lost, he's, lost okay bad, he's lost a bad bet there, maybe. <laughs> is that OK with you guys? I can't sorry. talk can about it, it, so... Are we replaying it to work? We'll do it after. Is that OK? It's fine. Oh, OK. Cool. As I said, Everton won their first match in 13 Premier League games. That would have been a huge relief. Then they've had more points deducted. Mm. There probably is uh, what we're hearing going to be an appeal. There's a lot of uncertainty, but what it means in the interim is that it, they are a lot closer to that bottom part of the table and the relegation quicksand. It's so easy to get sucked into that battle again. They have to keep pushing, obviously, until the end. Um, can you imagine what kind of state they'd be in mo emotionally and mentally, given what's been happening? I mean, yeah, I think it's, it's very unrelatable, I think, and it's hard to kind of imagine what that must be like. Um, I have to say, I, th I think they've done pretty well to, to probably do their best to kind of keep on the train of just we have to keep going and we have to keep going. Um, I think the fact that the saga has felt like it's lasted the whole, sort of, you know, not the whole season, obviously, yeah. but a good portion of the season. Yeah. I, I think that, would, for me as a player, would be the most frustrating. It's like, if we're going to be deducted points, let's know what it is. That's it. OK, now we know what the task is, let's go. The, the sort of back and forth, just I, I think I, that would be the bit I would hate the most. I'd be like, are we done yet? 
Yeah. You know, are they going to go to, we're going to get in a couple of weeks' time and then there's something else? It just feels that's the bit for me that sticks out as being pretty tough. Um, in saying that, I think they've done a very good job. It's the typical sort of Sean Dyche vibes of let's get stuck in. People don't want us to do well. Well, we're going to show them. Um, I think defensively they've been very good. You know, I, I think they have that structure. They have that grit. I think they have players that buy into that. Um, and I think I think they'll be OK, but I, it's been a very, very tough year and I, I definitely don't envy any of the players from being in that experience because I, I think I'm sure it's taken a toll. Yeah, that us versus the world mentality. Yeah. They're going to have to lean into that and keep leaning into it because they did get a point at Newcastle. They got victory over Burnley. Um, all thanks to Dominic Calvert-Lewin, who is back in business. That's mm. huge for them going into the last few weeks. Yeah, a couple of goals in his last two games now and the confidence is coming back. I think he finally trusts his body. Again, you can speak more better than the whole injury situation and, and the psychology around trusting your body uh, than me. Um, but his confidence is coming back ever so slowly. When you consider that Chelsea have conceded 52 goals so far, that's more than they conceded in the whole of last season. There is no team they don't concede against. Uh, they conceded against Sheffield United, against Burnley. They're two of the lowest scorers in the Premier League. Everton are among the lowest scorers in the Premier League. But against Chelsea, you always have a chance. Yeah, our stats man uh, heartbreakingly told me that Chelsea have dropped... 15 points against clubs in the bottom six. I could hear the tears when he was talking. That is tough. I mean, with Chelsea, you just don't know. Last week sums up their season, doesn't it? Because they beat Man United. They did it in such dramatic fashion. And then they drew with Sheffield United. Yeah, I think they've been underwhelming. Um, they've got a lot of good players. They've obviously spent a huge amount of money, as we know which in some t sometimes that brings more scrutiny and is a little unreasonable because it's very difficult to, yeah. you know, put a team together with so many new, you know, faces that have to try and gel. Um, I find them a little confusing whenever I've seen them this season. I, I don't quite know what they're trying to do. I think, again, they've been a team probably that has lacked that consistency. And, you know, I think people talk... I think a lot of people, you know, they talk about Cole Palmer as being sort of the talisman, the, the player that can make the difference and I actually think at times this season that's also hindered them because yeah. you find him sort of drifting in and almost doing his own thing which you know but in doing that he's got the capability to change a game as you know he did in the last few minutes against United but at the same time I don't necessarily think that always allows that team to build that fluency yeah. and, and that good structure and good play um, so yeah I kind of don't know about Chelsea they're again they're a bit of an uncertain I think they could go quite easily this weekend and put two or three in and it'd be very comfortable and at the same time I think it could go completely the other way. I think that's how all of us feel. I think that's been the story of their season. We are going to go around the grounds now to hear from all the managers ahead of match week 33. Let's whip around the Premier League. They have more bite. They look more difficult to, to beat. They, it's much more... Everything I would expect from a Chris Wilder team, uh, I see that uh, now. Uh, speaking of Chris, a guy I think has done a, a very good job uh, in general, especially Sheffield United, and I can just see what he's building with the coaching staff now. We want to produce another big performance. We've had to produce big performances in, in all of those games, whether Bournemouth, whether it was, was Fulham at home, Liverpool away and, and, and Chelsea. Chelsea at home, so we'll need that type of performance to give us any opportunity of getting a result at Brentford. They force opposition teams to adapt, and for a team like Brighton to be able to demand that from even the bigger teams, um, that's, that's pretty exceptional. So that means that uh, it doesn't matter whether the top six teams play against them or whether, you know, like they have to adapt their game to be able to play against Brighton. They are playing very well. I watched the game in uh, Chelsea. Um, I think uh, they could win in, ten, in, in one player less in the second half. Uh, they play very well and they consider a uh, bad goal in uh, uh, Everton and they are uh, a live team. All the games in the Premier League are so hard that you cannot uh, minimize the, the difficulty of your opponent and Saturday is going to be very tough, very tough because Wolves is a good team. But um, like I said before, at the City Ground we've been playing good and uh, we'll try, we'll try and it's a vital game for us. Players expecting a tough game, tough atmosphere to go into 
um, and yet another test of, of where we are as a group and, and what we're able to produce. One that I'm really looking forward to. We're looking forward to seeing the players in, in that environment again and seeing if we can overcome another challenge. Yes, we have to show reaction, definitely, 100%. That's clear, but I cannot plan the reaction 20 minutes after the game when I gave in these 20 minutes constantly interviews. So even I have to think from time to time, and I will think about that. It's now not the first time in my life that I lost a football game, unfortunately. And um, yes, we will show reaction, I can promise. Every, every team has, of course, its strengths, and Liverpool has a lot of strengths, uh, strengths uh, but also their, their weaknesses, their, their, maybe the their zones where you can find space and where you can uh, create chances and score goals. But it's sometimes it's not too easy to find the space and to get the ball there, and you've, because they never give you time. You know, the last time we played Fulham, we were well beaten by a good Fulham team, no doubt about that. And uh, we know we're up against a, a good side, good manager, and we'll have to play really well. We, we know that, so uh, Fulham have got a lot of good players, and we'll have to be at our best. The amazing thing in Premier League, when you play against any team in this competition, and you, you, when you go to the game, everything can happen because both teams with quality, they are strong at home, it's true, we want to improve our way um, record as well, and uh, for sure we are going to do that with, um, with full ambition to, to, to get a good result for us, and a good result normal for us is to win the game. All right, we're going to talk quickly before we get into Darren's favourite. Look how excited he is to do predictions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so excited. <laughs> so excited. You have time to talk about Liverpool. 28 <clears throat> Premier League home games unbeaten. Yeah. Nobody told Atalanta about no. Liverpool's incredible home record. It's, it's probably a blip. I think most of us expect it to be a blip. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't respect Atalanta. Atalanta basically taught them that they're going to have to do that. But they've scored 127 goals so far this season, all competitions. They've got the firepower to blow Palace away. Palace haven't won away from home since November. I think Liverpool get back on the bike. Bike? Bus? Bike? Uh, I use the bus or the horse. train? Plane? Horse? <laughs> horse. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Whoever's feeding this info to us is, is just gone. They don't know. They just give us... Yeah. Um, right, we've got to go predictions now. Um, Rachel is new to the show when, when I'm here okay. um, this okay. season. Yes, so we are going to start with you. You've, you know what it's about. We've explained it to you. Mm. Do not copy Darren or copy him at your own peril. Okay. Good luck <laughs> to the both of you. All right, predictions time. It starts with Newcastle versus Tottenham. Right, I'm going to go a bit rogue here. I, I think they might stifle each other, so I'm going to call nil-nil. Oh, that's a call and a half. Yeah. Particularly oh. as I think it's going to be 3-2. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I Why do. do. The, the, the Spurs score goals. Mm. Um, Newcastle with the tsunami behind them are going to be expected to go at the front foot and go for the juggler. I think this is going to be a slugfest. 3 2. Brentford versus Sheffield United. Now, this one could be quite tight because they're both out of form. Uh, they both don't score many goals. I think this one could be 1 0 to Brentford. Mm. I'm going 2 0 Brentford. Yeah. I, I think that's. That'll be comfortable for Brentford, I think. You've given two clean sheets, three clean sheets in two games. Is that a different? I'm all for the centre backs. So. Okay. It's going to be a good, be it's be a good weekend. For the all right. Well, we'll keep that in mind. We got to, to go on to Burnley versus Brighton. Yeah. Burnley have actually played well the last few weeks, haven't got results. Um, I, I think Brighton will be too good, though, so I'm going to go 2 1 Brighton. Yeah, I'll go with that. Play out from the back derby. Um, and I think <laughs> Brighton are going to edge it by uh, taking advantage of a mistake when Burnley tried to play out from the back. Man City versus Luton Town. This is going to be close, uh, closer than people think. I think it'll be 2 1 to Manchester City. Oh, I don't think it'll be close. I think it'll be 4 0. Oh. Man City. What do you think will happen between Nottingham Forest and Wolves? Uh, I've gone a lot of away wins so far, but. Yeah. I do enjoy watching Wolves as well. Forest, they're a bit unpredictable. They might... Let's go... I'm going to go one each. I think it'll be a good game, though. That's not a bad shout, actually. I think I'm going to copy. I'm going to, I'm going to have to copy at least one. And I think that's a good shout. I think you can do whatever. <laughs> you <laughs> want. Do whatever you want. When you're halfway through now, Bournemouth versus Man United. 
Right, this is the one where I think there's going to be the story. I think Bournemouth are going to win it. I think Man United are not going to turn up. They got the point uh, the other day um, and they were the only side to stop Liverpool from scoring in the Premier League so far this season in December and then they were awful afterwards. I think that will be the same in this match. I think Bournemouth will win this 2-0. I'm going to go 2-1 Bournemouth. OK, we've got to pick up the pace uh, and we're going to stick with you to lead us. Liverpool versus Palace. Again, I think this will be quite comfortable. Um, I'm going to call 3-0 Liverpool. Yeah, I'm going to go along with that. Liverpool much better at home. Palace terrible away. I think off the back of a defeat as well, you'll get a reaction. Yeah. West Ham, Fulham. Close one this one, but West Ham being at home. Fulham score lots of goals, but West Ham being at home, I think they'll win that 2-0. I think the same. I'll go 1-0, so tight margin. Arsenal, Aston Villa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to go. I, ha I want to say 2-1 Villa. Oh, I'm going to go 2-1 Arsenal. Arsenal don't lose at home. And defensively, too good. OK. Last one, Monday Night Football, Chelsea, Everton. 3-3. Uh, <laughs> <three, three. laughs> <laughs> that was in the back of my head as well, actually. Three, Some, three. Something exciting. Big one, 3-3. Three, three. Uh, go I'll go 1-0 one, one Chelsea. 1-0 Chelsea. She's given them a lot of clean sheets. You've got a couple of away wins in there, but you all predict it's going to be drama, and that we can confirm for you. Premier League Match Week 33. Thank you so much to Rachel, and thank you so much to Darren as well. Great being in your company. We have enjoyed every single minute. Good night. <laughs>